This is the Home Tech Podcast for March 24th, 2023 from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. From Lewis Center, Ohio, I'm TJ Huddleston. And from Pickering, Ontario, I'm Gavin Campbell. And welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast about all aspects of home technology, home automation, fun, crazy stuff. Uh, man, we've been off for a while. I forget what we're supposed to talk about, but that, that gives us a, a way to, uh, to catch up on the news because there's, there's been a lot in the last, what, two weeks, I guess? Yeah, we went through a, a kind of a lull, you know, there was not, there wasn't much coming out for a little while. So it's, it's good to see some new headlines and we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Well, I was I was on vacation. I said, I'm screw this. I, there's nothing to talk about in the home technology space. So I'm going to go on vacation and um, I want to cruise, guys. And I don't know if you can tell me I'm kind of sick. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> As you do after you get off a cruise. <laughs> my, my, might have caught something on the cruise. I don't know. Just some nose decongestion, congestion, whatever. I don't know. It's, it's all coming out now. So it's lovely. It's very lovely. It's a, it's been a fun, it was a fun two weeks though. Cause we were, we were on a boat for 12 nights. Yeah. 12 nights transatlantic. And they basically start in Miami and stop in Barcelona. And, uh, then you fly back. So it was just, just kind of a whirlwind. I got off of a plane yesterday at four o'clock or whatever and drove back. That's pretty interesting. I've never been on a boat for more than a couple hours. I've never, slept on a boat or anything like that so i can't imagine what that's like it's it's like sleep i mean they're big they're big boats now so it's yeah it's like a whole city kind of thing going on yeah i, I got to play you know i usually bring the wi-fi thing with me the what's it called the travel router with me and and hook it up now when i left last last time i didn't edit the show in time i did download all the files no i didn't download all the files <laughs> <laughs> so um gavin Thanks, thanks for your well, 1.2 gigabyte download, by the way, on, on, <laughs> on the ocean Wi-Fi. How do you took, have a 1.2 oh. gigabyte audio file? I, I, I didn't realize you would be not using fiber for this. You know, I, I thought you got the new <laughs> fiber and everything. I, I was sending you bigger files. Sea fiber. Yeah, there was there was absolutely no fiber on the oceans network. I don't know what it was using. But it definitely had had issues. And uh, how how long was it? I, I don't know. You know why? Because I just gave up. I hit cancel on that download, and I just downloaded the one that was cut for the show on this thing. And that's what everybody got was was the backup audio version, which was not. I think it was like 500 megabytes or something. It was something a lot smaller. I think I also record. I'm recording in high quality too. Mm. You, know? you, you said you wanted the best quality possible. I don't think Seth ever said that. Mm, no, I I said I said you know mono is fine and um, I don't need stereo audio. <laughs> okay, well this week it's mono. 192 kilobits or whatever you're recording in. I I don't need that much and I don't need <laughs> I don't need the leading I don't know hour and a half of 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 dead air before the show that we're just chatting it up. Whoa, whoa dead air i mean that's good that's good content that you're just cutting out uh, yeah that's good this, content. i mean it's <laughs> <laughs> that locker room talk is great content <laughs> cut and it, it's it's put on the uh the locker room no it's put on the ocean floor at this point so so i'm recording yeah. at forty eight thousand kilohertz 32 bit uh mono is that good enough for you that's perfect perfectly fine i guess 32 bits kind of high but you know it'll work 40 48 is fine all right cool <laughs> denying us gavin's silky smooth voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm at 500. I'm at 500 meg already, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> we just started the show. Two minutes into the oh, show, we're, we're, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all right. He's back on land now, so it's okay. You can download uh, all the files. You got fiber. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've got the fiber connection, and if I go reboot my router and not my computer, I'm sure it'll be fine. But um, refusing to reboot my computer. Uh, so, so, so I, I downloaded it, uh, the, 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 the files, I, I put them on my iPad. I was able to edit on my iPad a lot faster than anything. I just kind of like toodle around and, and then I uploaded everything from, uh, from, from the ocean. So the last show was actually, uh, you know, somewhere about like three or 400 miles south of Bermuda. I'd uploaded it. So that's kind of cool. That's nice. Nice. We're just traveling the world, you know? Yeah. It, not on the show. We could have recorded from, <laughs> from the boat, I guess, but. <laughs> that would have been fun. There, there wasn't many places that were quiet on there. We had some some rough seas. So like the seas were four meters, four meters. I guess that's, you know. Like the wave what? height? or Yeah, yeah, like 15, 20 feet. I was like, because I don't know much about seas, but I feel like they're higher than four meters. Uh, I mean, it seemed big enough to me. Like it was moving this giant boat that we were on. So anyway, it was fun. I recommend it. Uh, aside from the sickness that you're inevitably getting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my mom's going on a cruise in like a week. I'm like, you're definitely getting sick. She's like, no, I'll be fine. I was like, eh, I don't think so. 
I would assume at this point you could just automatically assume you're going to get sick on a cruise. Yeah. 12, 12 nights will, will get you there. I don't know. Like if you're only there like three, four nights, I'd recommend it. Like they don't, it doesn't have time to catch you until you're off. But there were seven, we set like a world record. There were like over 7,000 people that were on the boat. So it was a very large boat. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> it was the most people that have ever, ever crossed the Atlantic on a single ship. Didn't know that going into it. I was just like, hey, cheap, cheap tickets sound fun. And we've got spring break to kill. So let's do it. And then it wasn't cheap. There's, you know, the drinks cost a lot of money. Yeah, they always get you with the drinks. You got to buy the, the drink package. If, even the drink package is pretty expensive. I mean, it's not like the, the drink package is cheap, but it is the better deal if you're going to drink a lot. You got to drink a lot to, to meet those drink packages. Yeah, that's why some people go on cruises. They they go to drink, you know? Yep. No, I, I went to eat like uh, your your food vacation things. Like, yeah, I, I ate. I ate very well on a cruise. Um, the, the food is basically free. It's decent food most of the time. I noticed towards the end, we're not like getting the freshest of bread and uh, <laughs> berries like strawberries and, and blueberries were nowhere to be found. Like we could not we couldn't find them. Any, but guess what? Ice cream, plentiful. So yeah, what are you going to do? That's good. That's what matters. You know, the ice cream makes the world go round. So good ice cream, too. So we'll recommend. All right. Uh, well, we do have uh, after being off for two weeks, I guess we do have a couple of uh, couple of home tech headlines. So what do you say we uh, jump into them? Let's do it. All right. I, I actually saw this news from 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 the high seas, I guess. So Wemo has paused development of Matter smart home devices in an email exchange with uh, Jin Wei, vice president of global communications and corporate development at Belkin. Um, she confirmed with, with, I guess, The Verge over there that the company is convinced that, quote, matter will have a significant positive impact on the smart home industry. It, it meaning Belkin or Wemo, has decided to take a big step back, regroup and rethink its approach to the smart home. Uh, we went on to uh, explain that, uh, that uh, Wemo will bring new matter products to market when it can find a way to differentiate them from stuff that's coming onto the market. But it seems like Wemo is pulling way back and, and not going to matter anymore, I guess. Gavin, um, I'm going to you first because you say they were going to screw it up. Are, are they screwing up? And here we go. This is step one. No, this is, this is I think, something we mentioned along uh, way in the beginning that, you know, products are going to have to find ways to stand out from the crowd once we go to this way. You know, like when if Wemo implements matter... Do we really need their app anymore? You know, like stuff like that. Like a lot of stuff gets thrown out. I, I, I'm, i you know, I'm just happy they are taking a step back and they didn't say, no, we're not going to support matter. They're just going to rethink it and figure out how they can, um, I guess, monetize it or create their little ecosystem. But I see, I, I predict more companies are going to be like this, you know, um, there's just no money in it. Just when you, unless you have your own little ecosystem. Pow, right in the kisser. Just knocking them out right now, you know. Yeah. Matter, it's it's not really not really getting there, but time will tell. I mean, I know there's certain people that listen to the show and they have high hope in matter, but I'm still in the uh, still in the opposite side of the fence. I mean, matter is is more for these manufacturers like Wemo and everything, everything, so they can instead of having to develop for both HomeKit, Amazon, Google, and everybody, they they can at least get the onboarding centralized and put into place. But I don't know, like, it doesn't seem like it's something you have to do as a company. Like, you can, but I mean, what is, we were saying they're going to differentiate themselves. Like, well, what do you have to differentiate? Like, you have a smart plug, right? Like, yeah, I mean, my, look, my thing is, right, is that like the onboarding process and like the adding devices to another ecosystem is 100% important. I don't think anybody's arguing that. But I think at this point, like, we just need more from smart home devices. We, we need them to just work and we need them to work with all of the features. I mean, it just if if no if you can't use all of the features in a product right away with that new standard, a lot of people are just not going to care about it and they're going to use the default app. Yeah, I I guess. I mean, it it just doesn't seem like if Wemo wants to differentiate their products, well, it's like, well, here's a smart outlet. It turns on and off. You really don't need the Wemo app, so it's not going to differentiate. It's like there's nothing special about it, right? Like, so there's, there's nothing else that smart outlet's going to do for you outside of the matter app. So just make it and then shut up, I guess. Like, yeah, if you want to make your product differentiate, like make it do something else. Like we're going to talk about a smart outlet here. Um, I guess we can talk about it next, but like it does a whole lot more and potentially more depending on what accessories you pair with it. But like, 
that's one way to make your product stand out. Not like backing away from like an industry led and, 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 and onboarding solution. Like, I don't know, like this is what it was made to, pre- made to prevent. We've all been saying, no, oh, it's not really going to matter. I guess it doesn't like, does I, is Wemo like a big enough player to even like, does, does it matter if they leave this kind of thing and don't support it? I feel like Wemo is probably one of the bigger DIY brands. I don't know how popular they are compared to others. But I feel like Wemo is is one of the more recommended ones for like some basic automation stuff. Uh, I really so when I first started, I, I went with all Wemos and I had a whole bunch in my house. And, you know, when you had the first two in the house, they work pretty good. But after when I started getting 10, 14, yeah. you started seeing lag and then they're on your Wi-Fi, you know, like they're just bogging down your Wi-Fi, you know, because they're doing a lot of broadcasting. Um, from each switch then they do their auto updates you know they get that i i just i had to rip them all out and i got rid of them it it was a few months i had them so i mean maybe that's their play make some more reliable products and then uh they'll differentiate differentiate those from the amount of stuff that's all buggy i don't (laughs) i have no idea like well yeah i mean that's what and that's what companies are going to do right is in in order to differentiate yourself from everybody else that makes the same plug that's compatible with the same products, you're going to have to add extra features to it that are not going to work within those other ecosystems. They're only going to work within your own. Yeah. So like I get the value of like being able to add any kind of outlet you want to your ecosystem. But like, if you can't do like power reading and all that good stuff that matter doesn't support right now, then you're probably just going to default to the regular Wemo app and, and use it off Wi-Fi and all that good stuff. Because why why maintain two separate things at that point? Unless that's like Alexa integrating with it or something, I guess. <laughs> we're we're seeing a ton of uh, of things pop up in the chat about um, uh, Wemo is basically not working and dropping off. So uh, not a big player according to Ty. Yeah, uh, they just drop off for no reason according to I am Canadian. So like, yeah, that is. Yeah, they're Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what. And, and that's. I have the Wemo devices too, and I. I. I had issues, a lot of issues with them, like these issues, Wi-Fi related. I'm like, these are garbage. They don't work, you know. Uh, and then I. I did. I ended up hooking up my the the Ruckus system here at the house. No issues whatsoever. Um, I haven't tried them because I, I usually use them seasonally, like around Christmas time. So I have them on the. I have the Netgear stuff on right now. I haven't tried them with these, but I, I they've been extremely solid with the <laughs> uh, extremely solid with uh, with with the Ruckus gear and the the Ruckus network I had set up. So I don't know, like could just be incompatibilities with with certain Wi-Fi features that get turned on, that kind of thing. So I don't know. Usually fixed with a reboot. That's what I was laughing at because I'm refusing to reboot this computer. I don't care what problems we have, yeah. Gavin. It's not. Seth hasn't rebooted his computer in at least six years, so <laughs> he's holding off. It's a Mac. It doesn't need to reboot. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get viruses either. No, exactly, exactly. All right, well, let's talk about that that new the new product here. We've got a um a new uh product from we got a new product from a, com- a U.S. company called Intecular. Uh, assuming not launching its first matter compatible smart wall outlet. What's different about this one is uh, you can kind of like put some extra extras with it that kind of like help define what you want that product to do. Uh, so like the faceplate, each each faceplate option gives you a different features and that kind of thing, depending on what you want it to serve in the house, right? So they've got what's called an, an Invesa Deco Air, and it's got an air quality monitor, LED indicators. Um, you kind of look over and kind of see how the air quality is in the room just at a glance with it. Include sensors for temperature, humidity, CO2, and VOCs. Uh, Invesa Deco Light, it's, it's a, also a trim plate. Uh, it can work in tandem with the existing smart lights to adjust the brightness, depending on the ambient lighting, as well as contain a small night light uh, that turns on uh, it's basically on the bottom of the faceplate. And then they have a motion one, a uh, built-in motion sensor, detects move and, and trigger, trigger automations, that kind of thing. So it's all based around like just basically a core smart switch, but then you put the smart plates on. And that's that's really cool. All matter compatible. Um, the pricing was up there. Uh, <laughs> it's like a hundred bucks a pop, right? And I guess you can get all three for 179. So that's, I mean, that might help, but man, um, kind of expensive. Uh, to kind of like pair all this stuff up. I, I 
I, I do like it. it. Seems like a pretty pretty cool idea. TJ, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's a cool idea because you know, as we were talking about before the show, is you could customize it for the different areas of the house, right? So in the hallway, you might want like a little motion light. In the bathroom or or in the kitchen, you might want the air quality sensor. So that way you can know when Gavin's using the restroom. (laughs) Um, And you just change out the faceplate. So you buy the same outlet, you put a new faceplate on it, and bam, you're you're good to go. So I can see this being a thing. The price is a little odd, though. You know, a lot of people have problems spending $100 on a light switch or like $70 or whatever $60 is for the Lutron Caseto switch. A lot of people grab their chest like they're having a heart attack. Uh, so a hundred dollars for an outlet is kind of a tough sell to me, but I guess if it's doing all these extra things, it might be worth it. Not Wi-Fi either. So it'll work. Unlike Wemo. Yeah. Is it thread? I guess it's, it works over thread, right? Is it me? Yeah. Matter, whatever it's matter compatible. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The, the price on this is a tough swallow, especially if you're going to want more than one of them. Um, you know, it reminds me of, uh, you ever see those little face plates that you can replace that have the light built into it? It kind of like slides over your existing outlet and makes contact with the power there. And that's how it gets powered. It reminds me of that. And even if they just sold that and made something like that and sold, it would be kind of cool. Right. That would be a much easier install. Right. Um, but I, I like to see innovation in this space, though. Um, the one thing I just don't like is why don't they just have one plate that has all three of these things in it? You know, like. Why do I have to switch up the plates? I want one with everything, you know? Well, and that's kind of what I was thinking, right? Because they're not, I mean, the one is kind of advanced that's doing the the air quality sensor and stuff. The other one's just like a motion and a light sensor for the separate one. So like they could totally do it all three. It's probably just a cost thing though. They, they'd probably have to charge like $200 for this outlet if they were to build all of it. So they just give you the option to customize it. Yeah, there was there was a, a post on um, slash R home automation, right? or r slash home animation, whatever you want to say, um, the other day about this. And it was, it was some kind of like little display, like a little, like beautifully made and crafted display. I tried, I, I thought I wrote it down. It was, it was, I saw, I ran across it while I was on the cruise and, um, I'll have to go back and see if I can find it, but it, it had like a uh, e-ink display, kind of like a little like heads up sensor data runs on the little battery, um, had been really like, been like this, project uh, you know passion project it was like they were charging 129 dollars for it and people were just losing their mind it was like i can get this for like four dollars on alibaba <laughs> and it's like yeah but it's what <laughs> like oh man like tough crowd here yeah the the home automation separate it's a terrible judge for this kind of product just because it's mainly made up of diy people and they're heavily focused on like making their own stuff right right so like you know there's like a current top post right now and it's like a minimalistic door sensor but it is quite large and way more complex than like a regular door sensor and paul in the chat mentioned swidget i I think it's called swidget yeah that it reminds me of that that was a while ago it's been a number of years since they came out but they had that outlet with the middle that you can pull out and put other modules into it. And that, I when I first saw that, I thought that was really cool because they had a lot of modules that you could flip around. Yeah, I, I think this whole idea is pretty good. And, you know, it allows you to kind of cut down on the waste a little bit because you can just put what you want where. But they got to work on the pricing for it. You know, if this was in the 50 to like $75 range, I feel like people would buy this up. But a hundred dollars, it puts it way outside the budget for a lot of people. Yeah, I think, I mean, well, for a smart switch, a hundred dollars for a smart switch, like an in in wall outlet. What do those usually run? I want to say they're around that price, like forty bucks or something. So it's it's on the high side there. So I mean, like I I don't think when you break it down, it's not that bad. But it's just it's one device that you're gonna have to buy how many for, and that's what people are looking at. Like if you just need one, a hundred dollars is not bad. But if you need like a dozen. That's twelve hundred dollars just on outlets, and be, where before you would spend that, you would spend like twenty dollars an outlet or something like that, you know, for a normal thing. And obviously, you're getting some extra s- sensors and all that good stuff, but it's just a big jump. Right, right. And, and I do like that it's using like an existing thing that exists in your house. Like you're not cutting a new hole in the wall or anything like that. Although, like there are certain cases where I would like worry about like, well. Like a motion sensor, you know, somebody comes in and puts a piece of furniture in front of this outlet because, you know, 
<laughs> Why would you want to see an outlet on your wall? Like, uh, then it's no, it's useless. You know, it's not a very good motion sensor at that point. Ambient light, same thing. Like somebody leans something up against the wall and like, it's well, now the lights are on full bright and I don't know why. Um, it, it's kind of weird. It's kind of a weird place to put it, I guess. I don't know. It seems like this would work really well on like a paddle dimmer or, you know, like a, a decor dimmer. Like it'd be great to have that instead of an outlet. Mm -hmm. Um, that makes yeah. sense. Maybe they're aiming for like newer houses because I know if you have a, like an older house, outlets were kind of like a rare thing in a lot of spots. But in new houses, they're like every six feet or something. So I mean, it's there. There's a ton of unused outlets every single house that I go into now. So maybe like they're aiming for that kind of thing. I mean, my house I have one on each wall. <laughs> if I'm lucky, right? Yeah, in newer houses there would be two on each wall. So yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it is an interesting thing. I don't think, and you don't need one on every one. That's what I'm saying. Like you could just use on one on the one that's, that's, that makes sense for whatever you want to do in that room. Mm -hmm. And if, but I'm thinking like to get all of that sensor data for the particular room, like you might not want to be reading the ambient light in from an outlet location. Like I think the better location would definitely be the smart switch location up higher and that this, this may not work very well for that, but I don't know. Great idea. Matter compatible. Good luck to these guys. It's pretty cool. So, um, I guess we let's talk about uh, Toronto-based smart home, co smart light company, <laughs> <laughs> Nanoleaf. I wonder who put this into our show notes. Uh, they're, they're rolling out three new matter compatible lights as part of its essentials lines: the A19 BR30 bulbs and a new light strip are the first ever matter smart lighting uh, smart lighting available on the market. Uh, says Nanoleaf. Uh, the lights work with matter over thread for seamless setup and control and offer white and RGB lighting. Uh, the Nano the Nano matter enable lights will open for pre-order on March 22nd on the company's website. The A19 smart bulb and light strip will be globally available on the website uh, for uh, prices ranging from $19.99 to $49.99. And the BR30 will start being available April on 2023. Um, and new other new bulbs like the GU10 and a recess downlight coming later this year. Um, also, in this story, uh, Nanoleaf also said existing modular lighting panels, uh, light bars, including shapes, elements, canvas, lines, will receive an over-the-year update later this year to make them compatible with matter. So unlike Wemo, Nanoleaf is basically all in and uh, pushing out matter all their products pretty cool i didn't know they were a canadian company you know like i just threw this on there you know like hmm. but because they are a canadian company feel free to buy them based on promises they're telling the you truth know, like, <laughs> they, they won't let you down they, when they say coming later this year they're gonna bring it later this year don't worry about it they're canadian but no this is good to see I, i've been trying to get my hands on a matter a thread-based matter device i don't want a wi-fi based one but there are a couple thread-based ones out there, but I can't get a hold of one. So this may be the first one I order. Yeah, the Nano Leaf stuff looks pretty cool, but it's way too expensive for what I want to spend on lighting. But a lot of the products do look cool. They, you can kind of add to them and all that good stuff. So I definitely see the use case for it. Maybe one day I'll be rich enough to buy some. Yep, yep. Well, uh, let's 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 talk about the stuff we can afford to buy, TJ. Um, uh, switch. Switchbot, oddly enough, another Canadian company. No, they're not. They're based in like Delaware or something. <laughs> uh, a smart home company, Switchbot, is introducing a new matter enabled hub. Uh, the $69 Switchbot Hub 2 arrives in March and will work with all existing and new Switchbot Bluetooth devices, enable those devices um, that are supported by the new smart home standard to work with matter. So that, that's pretty cool. TJ, you were saying this is a really cool uh, product and that you liked it, especially for $69. Nice. Nice. It is uh, substantially more expensive than the uh, two SwitchBot hubs that I have right now. I think they were like $25 or $30, so this is more than double the price. Uh, but you get some nice added features. You get the, the temperature and humidity. It's got a little screen on there. So, I mean, it seems like a worthwhile upgrade if you care about that stuff. But it is, it is significantly more. And uh, Ty is a bing, bing the bell. There we go. Thank you, Ty, for reminding me. Uh, new hub. <laughs> new hub time. Uh, yeah, I had to dig it out from my desk here. But pretty pretty cool. My uh, All my all my switch spot stuff has worked all right. Um, both systems. So I have one system at the house that controls a uh, uh, lock. And then I have a system at the office that controls my garage door uh, via one of the little push button things. 
And both of them I've had to reset one time because they've just dropped the Wi-Fi connection for some strange reason and they wouldn't work again. But after I've reset them, they've been fine. Knock on wood there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, not not terrible products for the price. So I'm not hating. Switchbot's one of those companies. I like what they do. I like what their price are. I just can't get over the hump, like the aesthetics of their products, you know, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I really like everything they do. I like the company. It's just the aesthetics of their products. But yeah, it's good to see that they're getting on the matter train. You know, um, I, I, I might grab that hub because I picked up a SwitchBot device the other day to do some testing with. And if it, but I have it integrated directly with um, Home Assistant. So, you know, I might not need the hub in that case. Are you just using the little button pusher? Yeah, a little button pusher, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's nice because you can pair it directly to Home Assistant with Bluetooth. Yeah, I, I can automate you it. You cannot do that with the lock or anything else, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm trying to do some other things with it, and but it's just not powerful enough. I'm finding the motor inside. But, you know, it, it's, it's a cool little device. Like when you think about what it does and how they did it, it's really cool. So... I might buy a coffee maker just to put the button on it. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I, I, I thought this was going to be for flushing the toilet. I thought that was where you were going with it. I'm like, oh. I tried. It's just not powerful <laughs> enough. You need a stronger motor in there to, to flush that toilet. You know? The like, problem is Gavin needs to flush several times. Yeah. And it's just it's not up for the repeated so action. Levers and pulleys, my friend. It's the fulcrum, the power of the fulcrum. Yeah. No, mine, uh, mine at the office is uh, double-sided taped and silicone to my remote garage door controller so I can open it from anywhere that I have internet, and it works great. It looks like butt, but it works great. My, uh, my neighbor came over the other day, and he was like, how did you open the garage door when you, were, uh, when you were on the phone with your delivery person? So I like walked him over to the button that's like hanging off my shelving unit. And I was like, this right here, this, <laughs> this piece of magic <laughs> piece of work here. <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Ring has announced a new battery doorbell plus. Uh, it's the first battery power unit with 150 by 150 degree field of vision and 1536p video. No idea why they stopped at 1536, but there it is. Uh, it says the new greatly increased view of the vertical space will make it easier to see a, or get a head to toe view of your new of your visitors, as well as visibility when the driver leaves a box um, uh, up at the door on the floor. Uh, the Ring Battery Doorbell uh, Plus is available pre-order today for 180 uh, with shipping begin expected to begin in on April 5th. Um, I, I do like I do like this this trend where we're getting you know better video but also getting like a wider view angle, especially to see like what is down like down being delivered, like seeing people drop stuff off and that kind of thing. It's very useful. Like I think when all these video doorbells came out, it was like, well, you want to see his at your door. But as it turned out, like the camera lens, basically you can't see your floor mat. You can't see your door unless it's positioned, you know, just so and, and correctly. Um, and turns out we've been getting a lot more deliveries, you know, especially through the pandemic. And you couldn't see when people were, what people were delivering. So I think it's really cool to see like solutions start to finally come out around this, this uh, particular feature. And the one thing I have to say about ring is they have some great marketing because my mom, actually emailed me asking me about this <laughs> and i'm like i don't know where she heard about this or how she heard about this but she was like hey there's a new ring doorbell did you know and i had to talk her down off the ledge because she already has one she already has one she doesn't need to upgrade it i just <laughs> outfitted her with three ring devices she doesn't need another one but I guess that was her gateway drug into uh, home automation at that point, right? Yeah, I can't believe you installed that old stuff when you knew this stuff was coming out. She wants the latest and greatest, Gavin. Just give it to her. Oh, geez. Like, don't get me started. But uh, it, it's cool that they went with the single lens instead of the, the dual um, camera setups that I've been seeing some people do. You know, where they have one camera looking down and one camera looking out. I like that they kept it in one frame and, uh, you know, like it, it will probably roll out to their other cameras eventually. Yeah, I, don't, I, I wish it was in the Ring Pro because I like using the slimmer model. I think it just looks, looks better, more aesthetically yeah. pleasing. Um, yeah, they'll come to that. I'm yeah. sure they'll get it eventually. Yeah. yeah, I don't see why they couldn't. But that kind of thing usually filters through the line over time. Like they, they, they each, each of each one of their products has a different time that it kind of like starts and gets rotated out and uh we tend to see like the 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 battery stuff like get 
I don't know, like it seems like the battery, like the lower end battery or the mid level battery stuff gets the gets the new tech first. Um, and then the pro stuff starts getting updated. So I don't know. Hopefully we'll see this kind of stuff put on there too. I think the pro one did just get updated with like higher resolution. If- yeah, it did, but not this super sweet camera. Uh, I mean, yeah. come on. Yep. Now I like, I like ring just because a lot of their stuff is battery powered or, you know, wired powered. So that's always convenient. You know, most of the time when I'm installing it, I'm wiring them. Uh, but there's a lot of houses in America that do not have wiring at the doorbell or maybe there was a renovation and somebody got rid of the wiring or, or whatever reason there is. So having the battery as an option is, is great. It's definitely helpful. And Ring seems to, I mean, besides all their faults and getting hacked. I don't know. Do you guys see the story where they got hacked and it's like, maybe it's a story, maybe it's not. I haven't heard anything since it came out. They haven't acknowledged that they got hacked. So I don't, I don't think they actually did. They covered up the story. Yeah, I mean, I think if, I think Amazon would would, or I would hope that they it would probably be a bigger story if they covered it up. But um, I would hope that they have the disclosure and say, "Oh yeah, we got hacked." But somebody was saying that it was one of their partners or something that had API access um, that got hacked. It's always somebody else. It wasn't me. I can tell you that. Like, I don't think I was me. It's like that Spider Man meme <laughs> pointing at each yeah, other. Exactly. You. You. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, not, not me. It wasn't me. Paul wasn't me. Uh, Paul Ellis in the chat saying, I imagine the pro line sells way less than since the b- battery is easier to retro. I would assume so because a lot of homeowners don't want to touch wiring. No, no, absolutely. No, if, if you can if you can get it put up there and, and just take it down and charge it what once or twice, once a month or something like that. Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of houses I go to every day and I would say 10 to 20 percent of them, you know, if I had to take a guess had like a video, uh, a battery powered video doorbell installed right next to their doorbell. And it's always, it's always like the first thing I offer, like no matter what I'm there for, I'm like, you know, we could just remove the need for the battery, right? Like we can just install it. And like, eh, half the time they want to do it and half the time they're just like, eh, it works. I don't really care. Yeah, that's, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Um, it was, I mean, it kind of like bring this one up too. Aquara actually came out with the smart video doorbell G4. Uh, looks pretty decent. I, I mean, you're, you're definitely not going to miss the button to ring the doorbell on this thing. Like, <laughs> This ain't no doorbird. No. <laughs> this isn't your daddy's doorbird, no. Uh, th- th- it's got a bunch of neat things. 1080p video, kind of lower resolution sensor, 162 degree wide angle lens. Um, indoor chime repeaters included, which is nice. Um, seven days of free cloud storage, got SD local storage for recording. So you can manage that stuff local. Um, it's got dual power options for the outdoor unit as well. So you can, again, power it with a battery pack for up to four months, or you can use the AC DC transformer inside and power it over wire. Um, local fecal face, local, wow. Local facial recognition. Uh, I don't know how you do fecal recognition on your doorbell, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want <laughs> nope. that. Is that a cat or a dog? <laughs> this is the mailman. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know. It it doesn't look terrible. Like, uh, it actually, it's it's big, but it, it, it's it got a big, giant doorbell button. But other than that, it doesn't look bad. No, I'd go for it. I mean, it, it is like, a, for size reference, it's about three quarters of an inch wider than the Video Doorbell Pro from Ring. Um, so probably not going to fit in a lot of spots that I can install a Video Doorbell on. Um, but it does not look bad. Right. Um, it comes with a door chime in the box, which is pretty convenient. I can't really tell what the little thing is on the right hand side. It's on the edge, uh, past the camera. It kind of looks like a fingerprint sensor from the images, but it could also be, you know, anything else, I guess. I think it's a speaker. Is it a speaker? Could it be a speaker? I think it's a button. Possibly. Yeah, it looks like a button or like a cover, like a SIM card cover kind of Oh, it of could thing. be that too. So I was thinking it might be oh. like an SD card, but that seems like an awful security idea to put an SD card on the outside. <laughs> Just, yeah. But I don't see like an installation manual or anything, so I can't really tell what it is. No, they, and the little like expando view doesn't really show it. It shows the speaker, but it doesn't show. That's It's on the other side so the ex- mm-hmm. explode a view that they have on here. Man, this thing could be tiny if they just removed the battery, the six pack battery. If you if you scroll down the page, yeah, right. <laughs> it's only it's the width of the batteries, the battery pack, like six A batteries yeah. that they put in this thing. They need that though for the four months of battery life it can have. I guess so. Yeah. Um, but a good idea. Uh, did it say anything about the price on it? 
Uh, $120 on Amazon. You can buy it right now. Yeah, well, I would say definitely worth it. <laughs> yeah, definitely good. worth $120. Yeah. Uh, I'd be interested to see how well it works. And I mean, Ooh. I mean, look, look, this is the best feature. I don't know why Ring hasn't implemented this yet, but you can actually change your voice with it. So as you talk over the video doorbell, you can be a robot. Uh, or <laughs> the options it gives you in the description is to protect privacy. The G4 is able to change your voice to one of four options, such as uncle, robot, etc. Uncle? <laughs> or do you do you ask to record my uncle so that way you can sound like my <laughs> uncle? Is this somebody else's? Whose uncle is this? <laughs> It's like that creepy old man on Family Guy. <laughs> what are you boys doing? <laughs> oh god! Uh, this looks like this looks like a nice unit, though. I would I would buy this if I needed a big video doorbell. Um, it's one hundred and fifty dollars Canadian in in the Amazon store, so you know it's a good price, though. When you think about how much your, your others cost, this is not a bad price. And for what you get, it's pretty good. I like the flexibility with the batteries, or or you can have it powered. And the SD card. I mean, that's yeah. that's big, having local storage. Up to 512 gigs. I mean, think of how many days of recording. It does is. local streaming to, you know, your Google or your Madame A devices, you know, if, if you trigger it through there. I was trying to figure out if it supported, like, RTSP or streaming or anything like that. So we could hook it up to, like, other NVRs. But there's no information on that, so I have highly doubt it. Yeah, it would be nice if it, like, constantly stream. Like, you could hook it up like that if it constantly Well, streamed. yeah, that... Yeah, if you hooked it up powered, right, and then you could stream yeah. constantly, that would be fine, right? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can customize the ringtones as well. <laughs> I love this page already. This uh, this example says, uh, you know, personalized custom ringtones. A little caption above the video doorbell says, Tom is not home. Please come back tomorrow. And then next to it has a picture of the chime, and it says, Daddy is home. <laughs> Who designed this web page for this video doorbell? They it's should... an awesome website. Like, oh, I love the design, you know. They make it look like the coolest doorbell out there. The job well done. And you can get it in black or shadow gray. It's two distinct two distinctly different colors. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, they could have could like a, a white or like a more. beige or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, no slightly different. Black, but black and shadow gray, yeah. <laughs> but it has a matching chime too. Yeah, I mean that's so. cool. I like that it comes with a chime, you know, in the box. That's a good feature. And if it can announce Daddy's home every time I come home, I might just buy this now. It, it, it has to say it just right, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to put that in my home assistant to announce it every time I come home and the wife's watching TV. If wife is home, announce this. Yes. It does it by, by facial recognition, too. So automations yeah. are true. Daddy's home. Oh, man. I am glad we found our show title. I was worried about it, but no more. Uh, we always find something good. Yeah. All right. I know. Well, uh, moving on here to our. Oh, man. Moving on to our last security related topic. <laughs> oh, um, uh, Home Assistant has announced a security issue uh, that impacts installations using the Home Assistant supervisor. Uh, a fix for this security issue has been rolled out to all affected Home Assistant users uh, by the supervisor auto update system. And the issue is no longer present. Um, the supervisor is basically an application that runs on some installations uh, and is responsible for system management. Uh, the issue allows allowed an attacker to remotely bypass authentication and interact directly with the supervisor API, basically giving them access to install home assistant updates, manage add-ons, and backups. Uh, Analyst shows that this issue has been present in the home assistant since the introduction of the supervisor in 2017. It's been out there for quite a oh geez. Um, you can verify you've received the update on the home assistant page uh, and verify you're running uh, su uh, supervisor 2023.03.1 or later. Um, so that sounds like a pretty major thing. Get out there and update your home of his home home assistant uh, supervisor thing and get it get it updated. Yeah, and you know, like this article just came out, and there's already or later's out there. I think I've updated it three times <laughs> since. So <laughs> that's that's the thing about home assistant. There's multiple updates every week. So get to the or later's now. Yeah, I'm trying to see what the 
Well, I can't really tell what the percentage. They said it was like 33% have already been updated. But I don't I don't really know like of the super like they have these graphs that you can kind of go in and kind of tweak things around, but I don't know what it is. It seems like so the supervisor is the one that that you can basically like really get in there and tweak, right? That's the one that had that's the one you were making me run, right? It's not the one that you can just run on the Raspberry Pi or something, right? Yeah, I think the supervisor is the one that's uh, involved when you uh, set it up as a VM. Yeah, yeah. It gets set up there, so it handles updating and stuff like that. So, and I always encourage people if you're going to set up Home Assistant, throw it in a VM. It's so much easier. Yeah. Than a Docker or anything else. Yeah, it, it that's that's how I. I mean, I have it running. It's probably not updated, but uh, maybe I should. I don't know. It's not really exposed to the internet or anything, so I guess it's not that big of a deal. Um, so, yeah. go update, update. Updates are good. And it looks like people like their updates with Home Assistant. Man, they have been busy with updates. Jeez, Louise. Uh, well, luckily, this one you don't have to update. It just does it for you. So, yeah, there you go. That's nice. All the links and topics we discussed tonight can be found on our show notes over at hometech.fm slash 428. Uh, nothing in the mailbag this week, but we uh, do have a pick of the week thanks to Gavin. Uh, Gavin, uh, I think Gavin put this in here. So look back at Microsoft's 1999 smart home and what it got wrong and right. Uh, cool video. It kind of go- like went over most of the like voice assistant stuff and like daddy comes home. <laughs> the, uh, the, it Way recognizes cooler, though, you at I mean. the door. <laughs> So I don't know. It's it's and and like little pop ups on the in the corner of the TV uh, of who is you know at at the door and that kind of thing. A lot a lot of right stuff here. It was actually interesting to watch because it was from one ninety nine, I believe, right? So yeah, yeah, here we are, many years later, and they were predicting what the future the future would be like, and they were pretty good with their predictions. I mean, they were limited by the technology they had; like it didn't look as pretty as it does today. But uh, I wish they, they probably didn't um, predict like how many walled gardens we'd be facing, you know, in, in this day and age. But a lot of the stuff they do has become a norm to a lot of people today. What do you mean? It just, it just doesn't. The interfaces they're showing don't look any different than Windows. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, most of the time they look all it right. It looks exactly like seen. Windows 11. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but they have to reboot more often to fix problems. <laughs> it's the same Internet Explorer icon. Jeez. Uh, yeah. No, and I th- a lot of this stuff is really cool, but it's, you know, a lot of people don't realize that automation's kind of been a thing for several decades at this point. So a lot of this stuff was already happening. It just didn't happen for the average consumer, right? Whereas now you can go out and buy a, you know, $120 video doorbell that does facial recognition and stuff like that. Back then they were doing stuff similar, but they weren't doing anything, you know, as cheap as they were now and and nowhere near as clean looking. Right, right. I mean, the example that they have where it has the the TV and the picture in picture in the corner with the person, you know, standing there, it's another camera looking at the front door, um, you know, as, as they've come up and run, rung the physical doorbell because they didn't, you know, they didn't have video doorbells back then. Why would they even conceive of having a camera right at the doorbell? Um, but yeah, it... it it makes sense. A lot of this looks like, uh, I don't know, you guys remember like those interface for, oh man, I forget what it was, Life, Life, si- Richard is going to come on the thing and yell at me, uh, Life something. It was a uh, Microsoft's like media management thing and it looked really cool, but a lot of it kind of looks like the beginning of that, um, There's especially what they're showing on the TV. Life size? Life? No, that's a conference ring room thing. It was It was something with an L. I don't remember. He's yelling at the radio right now. Yeah, he will be. He will be. Don't worry. Yeah. Like, I can't really. I, can't, I mean, I can't. I mean, I, I don't really have much of a brain tonight because <laughs> I'm still in travel mode. So forgive me there, at least. Um, but I, I can see the interface in my head. I know I installed it on a bunch of win, uh, window computer and used like a IP control into like a keyboard, a little program that accepted commands to, from a key and converted them into keyboard commands because you had to run it from your keyboard, which was kind of awful. You had to remote with a keyboard on it. It was the dumbest thing ever. Uh, that would have been that would have been price per button database. Like we should go back and look at what those cost. You, you gotta, you, <laughs> we don't want to break it. Yeah, you you got a full full keyboard on the back of the remote, and you could type on your TV. How cool is that? Anyway, I don't know. Cool video, uh, a little nostalgic to go back and look at what was going on in 1999 and people having that computer, com- like a literal computer sitting on their their uh, computer 
in their kitchen. <laughs> that was funny. They, they, they actually had a full key computer. It was a CRT monitor yeah. sitting on there. I don't have that kind of counter space to put either. a computer on. Like that. <laughs> but could you imagine just, you know, coming home and saying, honey, I have a new computer for the kitchen. <laughs> and it up right there. <laughs> what she's going to say. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it wouldn't fly. You can take that out of here. <laughs> yeah. Daddy's not home. <laughs> for the For the time, though, that monitor is pretty thin, you know? I was still rocking a very thick monitor back then, so. Yeah, they, they have some LC, LCDs in this video. So, like, the early plasma LCD screens are what they're showing off. But I remember around that time, the monitors got so big and so deep that I barely had room on my desk for the keyboard. Because <laughs> right? the monitors were right so in your big. face at that point, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but they've come a long way now. Yep, 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 yep. No, it's, it's definitely small. They, um, definitely, I can, I can have a much... I, my desk is only like uh, 24 inches deep, <laughs> but I've got like arm stands that hold this, the monitor like off the back of the desk. So it's great. Yeah, those are the best. If you've got any feedback, questions, comments, or great ideas for a show, give us a shot. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can head over to hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. All right, project updates. Uh, Daddy is home and he hates printers again. <laughs> What's going on, Gavin? I really hate printers. You know, like... I. I I remember I hated printers and then I finally got it working properly. And, you know, for a while it was working. And I think I got an update from Unifier or something, but I hate printers again. These brother printers, and I, I was griping on uh, Mastodon about it. I think someone else was as well agreeing with me. And they also had a brother printer. So I was starting to think, hmm, my old printer was a brother printer. My new brother printer is a brother printer. They have a brother printer. Is it just brother printers? But every time my wife goes to print something, all I hear is, Gavin, it's not working. You know, and then I have to do the song and dance, and then I eventually reboot it to fix it, right? See, reboot. You got to reboot. <laughs> but I hate printers again. I'm still trying to figure out why this printer keeps going offline. It won't It won't stay awake or, you know, sometimes you go to, and it's all air print. It's all Wi-Fi. So there's something up with it. I just don't know. Huh. I give up. All right. So interestingly enough, I have a brother printer too. It's the HL3170CDW. It's like a color laser i think it was like a hundred dollars on sale um and i have it hardwired in um and recently and not like i updated this thing or anything like it just sits there on the network and prints things it's connected it says it's idled but recently on my wife's windows computer because she has a windows computer um she can't print. She goes, Gab, uh, she says not gavin she says daddy the printer daddy. <laughs> she says she says <laughs> Yeah, she says she says the the printer is not printing anymore. Um, you need to fix it, and that's that's what we've been doing. So I wonder if it's a Windows related issue, not brother, because I can print to it anytime I want. I'm looking at it right now. I can connect to it. I can check the options and supplies. I can Just wait till you levels. reboot your Mac. No, I'm not rebooting. I mean, because then my printer won't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> why would you do that? But I mean, our, our solution has been to go like turn the print. Like you physically have to walk up to that printer and turn it on out of that deep sleep mode for whatever reason maybe it's just a windows computer thing that's not updating or not waking it up from that deep sleep it's really weird that you it's it's all brother printers at this point now i'm assuming it's windows in your case i think in our case it has uh, no in in this case it has to do with uh air prints so it's coming from our uh, apple device oh yeah 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 i'll say talk Talk about yourself, because I have two brother printers that work great, and you better not mess them up. My my brother printer, like I I, I love this thing; it, it's great. I th- I'm pretty sure I can print from my phone if I wanted to right now. I like them. It's just I'm having no luck with the air print, and I just give up. So when she prints, she usually has to restart it, and then it starts spitting out everything. I hate printers again, though. Yeah, it's, is it just it's just it's just her phone. Just tell her to get a new phone. <laughs> but we did buy this. I did buy this photo printer. It just prints like four by sixes. Right. And it's, uh, is it Epson or Canon? One of them. And every time I go to print, it will never see my brother printer, but it finds this one. And there's no way I'm going to make the mistake of printing a document on my photo printer, but that one works fine. So I'm like, why does the brother one not work the, the same way? I don't know. I don't either. That's really weird. I, I check for a firmware update. Let me see if there's an update for it. Yeah, it's always something dumb like that. It's probably it's probably that the iOS devices got updated to a new version of AirPrint, and the other the brother is like on an old version. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's funny that's happening here. But I, I I love this thing. I have no problems with it. Get a brother printer. Make sure you get the brother printer. It's good. Um, 
TJ, TJ, you got an award, man. Yeah, this is a big, this is a big deal. What, what, what's this award about? You know, I got this glass shiny shard thing from the local chamber of commerce for entrepreneur of the year. So we had our annual dinner for the chamber. I think it was last week, last Tuesday or Wednesday. And to my surprise, I won an award. So that's been uh, that's been pretty cool. Congrats, man! It's the honor, on, entrepreneur of the uh, year award. There, yeah, DJ Helson, connect you. Very good, twenty twenty two. And it's the uh, it's the very first one, so it's the inaugural one. I feel like they made it for me, <laughs> but we'll uh, we'll find out who wins next year. I guess they just won't have it next year. It's like yeah, nobody else, you know. Yeah, I was so happy when I saw it because it, you know, to all of our surprises, you got awards. So I'm... you know, people like me, Gavin. <laughs> I know you don't believe it, but. A lot of people uh, like me, and I st- I'm still trying to find out why, to be honest. Like, I'm with you. I get where you're coming from and everything, but people like I, I wonder if I share the pre-show recording with them, what they'll think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I tell people about the podcast. I'm like, did I say anything bad about them? No, we never do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you've also been pretty busy. Um, you got a couple of projects on here on the list. I've just been doing nothing, because why would I be doing anything? Besides drinking Mai Tais on the Lido deck. But you, <laughs> well, that sounds better, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, you've been building things and labeling your van. So, yeah, yeah. so we're just going to do we're just going to do a project dump here because we've had a lot of stuff going on in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I got the the van lettered. So I've been I've had the van for about a year now. I think I got it in like May of last year. And it's just been, you know, a, a sketchy plain white van uh, for this whole year. And I couldn't really decide on what to get it lettered as, right? Like some people tell you that you should get a full on uh, wrap for the the vehicle. Some people say, oh, no, you just need like your logo and like your phone number. And I just I went back and forth on what to put on the van. And honestly, I'm very happy with what I did. So we'll put an image in the show notes there. Uh, But it's just my logo in the center of the van on on each side. You know, it says audio, data, security and video on the back as as you do when you're in this kind of business. Um, and then it's got the phone number and the website on the door on each side. And on the back, it's got kind of the, like the white perforated vinyl stuff. So you can see out of the back of the window, but they can't really see inside with, you know, my logo and all that good stuff. So I'm just very happy with how it turned out. It wasn't the most expensive thing in the world. I think it was like, you know, 1300 bucks or something for the installation and all the vinyl and all that good stuff. So I'm not hating at all. The installers did a good job, like even on the hinge that Seth is showing off here. So he's showing off the van on the video chat Um, on the hinge. They even put like the vinyl on there. So that way it wouldn't break up the 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 lettering any. So that way it wasn't just like a white space. So like they just did a very good job of of installing everything. Um, And I'm very happy with it. No, it looks great. It really does. Like you've done a great job here. I, I was under the impression that I would walk out like the next morning and just like hate it, you know, when I was initially talking about getting it done. But I walked out the next morning and I was like, yep, this this looks like a legit company's van. So I'm, I'm happy with it. Very good. Very good. I, I've also got a cubicle 2.0 going on. So I went and bought a used cubicle for the new office. Uh, it was like two hundred dollars. And, you know, it's good enough for what it is. But as I've sat here and doing the the podcast and stuff like that, some of the things are hard to control. Um, like I got some outside sound coming in and I've got some light that I can't control. So if I sit still for 30 minutes in my unit, it, the motion turns the light off and I have to jump off the podcast and go dance around for a little bit to turn it back on. Um, there's no like manual override on my unit. Um, so I'm, I'm building a, a bigger cubicle with like seven foot walls and i'm gonna put a ceiling on there maybe i'll get some nano leaf lights to kind of light it up um, but just something to kind of help out with the the audio quality and kind of give me like a more defined office area so seth uh, has it on the video uh, there if you're paying attention to the show right now um it, it's a work in progress i'm not in a rush to do it and it's a great way for me to learn how to build walls before i buy a house this fall so <laughs> it's uh it'll, it, it'll be a fun project and I mean, is it to code? Like, do you have to make it to code? Is there permitting involved here or are you just building a thing? Yeah. No, 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 absolutely not. It's just, it's just going to sit in the back of my office where my current cubicle is like, it's going to have an extension cord run through the back of it. Like it's not like a permanent structure by any means. And I don't know if my management company that like rents the office is going to care about it, but I I, I don't think they're going to. It looks care. fairly like it could be fairly temporary. Like you could just disassemble it if you did it right. Or just tip it over. Yeah. And this is so I, 
<laughs> it would just light it on fire, actually. Uh, and that's what I anticipate, right? Because I don't know how long I'm going to stay at this place. So I needed something that I could like take apart with relative ease. So I made it to where like I basically just take each side off and then I can put it somewhere. So I got to figure out how I'm going to do the plywood on top of that so I can kind of keep that same mentality. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a lot better than what I have right now. Nice. Nice. And then just one more thing. I'll talk about the other thing next week because we can talk about that any time. But I've been putting off buying an iPad Pro 12.9 inch because I just could not justify the cost. Right. So for the cellular option with 128 gigs, I think by itself is like fourteen hundred dollars. And then you add the keyboard case and then you add the the insurance and you're like seventeen hundred dollars for like a tablet. And I just I, I never wanted to spend that on a tablet, but having a cellular tablet that I can just whip out and kind of use like a laptop without having the the fullness of a laptop has been really convenient. And it's been so much better than the Android tablet I just had. And I understand that like the iPad Pro is relatively new compared to the Android tablet I was using. But like the Android tablet just had all kinds of problems where it would just randomly crash apps. And, you know, if you did split screen mode, the the apps had no idea of what was going on so that you couldn't really use anything in split screen. The iPad Pro software, I think, is really good for multitasking. You can do window on top of windows. You can do a split screen. um, And it's just a lot more well built for multitasking. So the software itself is is definitely an improvement on just like base Android on a giant screen. Yeah. It definitely it definitely hurt the the wallet though buying that. So Yeah, I just I I like I think we talked about this before. I just wish it was like twenty percent more computer and thirty percent less iPad. <laughs> like yeah. it's so close. It's so close to being actually just a full blown Mac computer, like in a in a in a really awesome one at that. Like I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, it can definitely be better, but it you know it doesn't really have any competition. So it's it's really good at what it does compared to everybody else because everybody <laughs> else sucks. Yep, yep. I mean, they still they still go down to like the three hundred, maybe two three hundred dollar range, two two ninety nine to three ninety nine somewhere in there, and, and all the way up to what you're talking about two thousand dollars for an iPad. It's crazy. Yeah. And I wanted something with a big screen. Like I needed something that I could, I, you know, I, I go to job sites and I want to pull up diagrams or I'm going to like meet up with somebody and I just want a quick way to pull up stuff without bringing out my giant 17 and a half inch laptop that always needs to be charged because I don't use it that often. And it doesn't have cellular built in. So I have to like hotspot off my phone, which drains both batteries at the same time. This thing, I just, I whip out anywhere I'm at and I just use it. Yeah. And that, and that's super convenient. Battery's always on because, I mean, they last forever. But, the yeah, the, with that screen, it'd be good for, like, um, you know, the pictures that you take with the theater. You know, you could just put those, like, um, previous work you've done. It's going to look great on the screen. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's definitely a good presentation tool, too. So, cool. Well, I've been wanting a newer iPad, but I, I just can't. I can't justify. Well, I could justify it, but I don't, I'm not going to justify it. <laughs> you don't need to. don't need to justify it. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, and I'm not a big tablet person. Like I've, I've went through many tablets in my lifetime. Mo- tablets for me are, are mostly inconvenient, but I think that maybe the inconvenience is solved by the cellular portion. So we'll, we'll see how I feel in a month or two, because with a tablet, you know, a lot of people keep it at their house, but if you take it with you, you're, you have to use a different device in order to basically use the tablet. So I'm hoping that the cellular portion it makes that a lot more convenient and it makes me actually want to use it. And I'm only paying $20 a month for unlimited internet on it. So it's not like it's a big drain on on the wallet or anything. Like, I, I just use it whenever I want. Is that is that T-Mobile that has that plan or at and uh, So that's AT&T, AT&T. Yeah, yeah. Which was surprising. Yeah, I, I forget about that. They have that unlimited tablet plan that a lot of people use to put inside the, their home routers <laughs> uh, somehow but <laughs> yeah cool very cool well yeah keep us updated on how you like using it um let's so check into that now now you got me thinking like maybe it's maybe it is the cellular part that i don't like too much because it's it's 
it's kind of like the issue I have with with the tablet is not convenient because I don't it's not really ever connected to anything. And every app you have on your phone is connected. That's the problem. Right. Well, and that's yeah, that's the thing, right? Is that like and, and the tablet is basically just a, a glorified phone, in my opinion. It doesn't really do that much different. And so with your phone, you just pick it up and you use it. You don't really have to think about it. But the tablet, you know, if you don't have the cellular portion, it, it seems like it's a lot more thought that goes into it. And I've only ever owned Wi-Fi tablets before this. So yeah, James is saying I use iPad Pro every day at work. Check out Good Notes. I can recommend that as well. And Morfeo, Morfeolo Trace. I don't know about that one, but I will check it out. Okay, okay. Never heard of any of those. Good so Notes is, is a good note taking app. So works well. All right. Well, um, this wraps up this week. Uh, we do want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, uh, but especially those who are able to financially support through our Patreon page. If you don't know about the Patreon page, head over to hometech.fm slash support. Turn in how you can support home tech and our fledgling home tech.social server. Uh, <laughs> Mastodon instance. Uh, the, Join us. Yeah, yeah. It's been great. Like, I, I used it the whole the whole cruise. It was always working. I didn't have to worry about it. It's, it's working great. Um, for as little as a dollar a month, any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out here on the show. But every in, every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat the hub, uh, where you and other supporters of the show can gather every day and talk about all sorts of fun stuff. And TJ's award. Congratulations, TJ. It's awesome. Um, if you want to help out the show but uh, can't support financially, totally appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or positive rating in the podcast app of your choice. That wraps up another week of news here on Home Tech. We will see you next week. Take care. Farewell. I decided to use the um, travel router to basically break up how um man i i think it's on my end this is crazy i think it's on your end too yeah i don't notice anything did you reboot not rebooting gavin it's not happening (laughs) it's a it's a failure option (laughs) i I can't believe i'm arguing because we're gonna spend hours and days and then you'll finally reboot they'll be like i'll fix everything yeah Uh, it's looking like it is not it's not i don't know what it is it's something going on between here and the reboot (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt reboot it yeah reboot eh? <laughs> <laughs> no it seems to have stabilized but i don't know what is causing it i i was getting a lot of like weird things um <laughs> it's a boot time to reboot yes <laughs> <laughs> yes i don't know what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's back now it, it was it was something happened. I, I'm gonna have to reboot my router. I'm pretty sure. You see, you're gonna reboot everything but the computer. <laughs> I'm never rebooting the computer. No, I'm not rebooting. Yeah. The computer's the fine. Computer man. Hasn't the computer's been rebooted fine. since 1990. <laughs> I am proud of my uptime. All right. He hasn't rebooted it since he pulled it out of the box. <laughs> It's it's definitely it's the router. It's not or there's something going on in the internet router because I was getting I just got like five down five megabytes download so that was not good and then I just did it again. I did a test on the router. The router's fine. I did another test and it's back up to a gig. So I don't. I don't know, this is why we can't have nice things because Seth won't reboot things. I'm not rebooting. I updated the firmware on my printer. Let's see if this helps. Nope. Did you reboot it after you updated it? Though? <laughs> uh, no, it rebooted itself. So we're good. See, because updates usually reboot the computers. You just, that's that's the issue, man. If you got a good good setup, you don't update. That's the problem. If you update, <laughs> oh, I hope that uh, not uh, that non-rebooted computer can handle this 1.16 gigabyte audio file.